This being my first video here on the Syntax channel, I thought I'd cover a smorgasbord of tools and tips I find useful and use daily. I'll be serving up some tasty treats to curb your appetite for productivity tools, useful VS Code extensions, and more. Here's a preview of what's on the menu for today. If you're a picky eater, be sure to check the description so you can skip ahead to your favorite dish. And without further ado, here are 10 tech tapas to tickle your taste buds. I'm CJ, welcome to Syntax. First on the menu are universal keyboard shortcuts. So for these keyboard shortcuts, I will talk about the Mac shortcuts, but I'll also put the equivalent Windows shortcuts on the screen. Your first set of keyboard shortcuts are for working with words. So if I hold down the option key and press the left or right arrow keys, you can see that I'm jumping left and right over the words in the text. If I hold down the shift key, that will select words either to the left or to the right. Now, if I hold down option and press delete, that will delete the word in front of the cursor. And if I hold down option and backspace, that will delete the word behind the cursor. Now these keyboard shortcuts will work anywhere in my codes here. So you can see I can do like option backspace to delete the argument or option backspace to delete the assignment or to delete the variable name. Or if my cursor's in the other place, option delete will also delete in that direction as well. Now your next set of shortcuts are for jumping to the end of the line, beginning of the line, beginning of the document, end of the document, or selecting in either of those directions as well. So if I hold down command and right arrow, that'll go to the end of the line. Command and left arrow will go to the beginning and this will work no matter where your cursor is. You can jump all the way to the end or all the way to the beginning. And if you press up, that'll jump to the beginning of the document. If you press down, that will jump to the end of the document. Now, if you combine this with shift, you can select the whole document from the bottom or select the whole document from the top. Or if you're on any given line, you can select from where your cursor is to the end of the line or from where your cursor is to the beginning of the line. Now these keyboard shortcuts will work absolutely everywhere. So take for instance, if I am in the URL bar in my web browser, I can use command to jump to the end or the beginning of a line. I can hold down option and shift to select individual words. Also, if I'm inside of a text editor like Notion, I can use option to jump over words or option delete to delete the word in front of the cursor or option backspace to delete the word behind the cursor, command left, command right to jump to the beginning or the end. So these will work anywhere. Next, I'm serving up some apps you can use to remind you to take breaks. Micro breaks are tiny little breaks you can take throughout your work session that have been shown to reduce your risk of repetitive strain injuries or RSIs. These are things that can like affect your wrists and your tendons. And the idea is every 10 minutes or so, you take a 10 to 20 second micro break to take your hands off the keyboard or your mouse or whatever you're doing to prevent those repetitive strain injuries. Now, one of the apps that I like to use for this is called Time Out. It's by Dejal, and I have it set for a 10 second micro break every 10 minutes and a 10 minute break every 60 minutes. So it runs in the background and it will automatically pop up and remind me to take those micro breaks and regular breaks. Uh, Time Out is only for Mac. If you're not on a Mac, there is an app called Stretchly that is cross-platform. It works on both Linux and Windows, and it works in a very similar way. Next on the menu are DuckDuckGo bang commands. DuckDuckGo is a search engine and they have these things called bang commands or bang shortcuts. And when you're on DuckDuckGo, you can press exclamation mark and that will show you an example of some of the services that you can search across. Now, one of the ones I use a lot is Wikipedia. So if I do exclamation mark W followed by something I wanna search for, that will instantly jump me over to Wikipedia for the thing that I searched for. Now, I have DuckDuckGo set as my default search engine here inside of Firefox. So I can use these bang commands inside of the URL bar. So one of the things I do pretty often is I search NPM to search for a package. So I can do this, type in a package name, and that instantly jumps me over to NPM. Another one I use a lot is MDN. So if I do MDN and then something like object.values, that'll take me over to the Mozilla Developer Network and I can start looking at the search results here to learn more about what I was looking for. So these are super useful. And um, I was about to get mad at my break timer because I'm recording, but let's take a quick break. We're like in the middle of the video, right? Um, but uh, yeah, this is DuckDuckGo Bing Commands and uh, it's awesome. Next, we're serving up a useful CLI tool called TLDR. TLDR stands for too long, didn't read, and it's the name of this CLI tool. So it allows you to get practical examples of commonly used commands. So for instance, if I do TLDR LS, this will show me some practical usage of the LS command. Um, and this is actually much easier to digest than like the man pages. So if I do man, man LS, uh, this, there's a lot to parse through to learn how to use LS here. So it's super, super useful to kind of break down how to use the tool. Um, you could do it for many different kinds of built-in commands. So you could do it for like zip. 
and learn how to use the zip command, uh, even non-standard uh, CLI commands like FFmpeg. So if I do TLDR FFmpeg, that's going to give me some examples of some common examples of how I would use FFmpeg. So if you want to install it on your machine, visit tldr.sh. Uh, you can use NPM if you have it to install it globally, but if you don't have NPM, they have other ways to install it as well. Next, I'm dishing out a useful tip for Markdown on GitHub to make your block quotes stand out a little bit more. Now, when you're working on Markdown for a GitHub repo, whether it's in the readme or some other file, you pretty often want to call attention to some section of your Markdown, and GitHub has added a feature for that called alerts. So you can mark a block quote as a note, as a tip, as important, as a warning, or as caution. And the syntax is pretty simple. You just include a block quote above your block quote that is uh, square brackets followed by exclamation mark followed by the type of alert that you'd like to show. And this is super useful, especially like if you're writing documentation or onboarding notes and you kind of want to call attention to a specific section of the docs. Next on the menu, I will show you a way to create diagrams in Markdown on GitHub. Mermaid.js is a JavaScript library for drawing diagrams using text. So we can see here in the live editor on the left hand side, I have some text that represents a flowchart. On the right hand side, we have the actual flowchart. And they have a lot of other types of built in diagram types. So they have like sequence diagrams, class diagrams, state diagrams, entity relationship diagrams, lots of other ones. Mind map is really cool. Um, but you can use this syntax inside of Markdown on GitHub, which is awesome. So uh, in this example repo, I have an entity relationship diagram, and you can see that it's actually just a markdown file. But when we view this markdown file here on GitHub, we can actually uh, interact with it and, and we see the actual rendered diagram. And the thing that was committed to this repo was literally just a markdown file. So I have a block here that I denote as mermaid syntax. I put in my mermaid uh, syntax for that specific type of diagram. And then when you view that mark markdown file on GitHub, it will actually render out the diagram. Next on the menu, I will show you how to determine if an NPM package includes TypeScript types or if you'll need to install them separately. When you're working in a TypeScript project and you need to install a new library, you very often have to figure out, well, does that library include types or do I need to install them separately? Well, you can figure that out on NPM. So I am here on the React library page on NPM. And you'll notice this little icon it says DT. If you see that icon, that means the types need to be installed separately. DT stands for definitely typed. If I click on it, it'll take me to that types package and this is what I'll need to install. If however, you see a library that just has the blue TS icon, that means the TypeScript types are already included so you don't have to install anything extra. Next on the menu, I'm serving up a useful VS Code extension that allows you to take a JSON response and paste it as a TypeScript type. This extension is called paste json as code it's by quicktype and it supports a lot of different languages but we're going to use the typescript support so say for instance we wanted to call this pokey api and we wanted to call the pokemon endpoint to get back data about a specific pokemon there's a lot of data in the response here and it would be very cumbersome to create a typescript interface that describes this type but what we can do is we can go to the url copy the json response and then inside of vs code press command shift p search for paste json as code hit enter give it a top level name. In this case, the top level interface will be Pokemon because that's what we're describing here with TypeScript. And if you do that, you'll see that it will actually take that JSON data and generate a type from that data. Now this is super useful because if I am making a fetch request to that endpoint and I use response.json, you can see that it gives back the any type and I won't get any type completion there with the any type because uh, TypeScript and the editor don't know anything about that object we just got back. But if I add a type assertion here and then use that type that we just generated, now the editor knows exactly what that object is and we can get autocomplete when we are attempting to access properties of that object. Next up, I'll show you a useful extension that allows you to take pictures of your code using your preferred font and theme set inside of VS Code. This extension is called CodeSnap and it's super easy to use. So let's say I have some codes here that I wanna tweet out or upload to Instagram or something for fancy internet points. Uh, select your code, press Command Shift P, search for CodeSnap, hit enter, it'll take the picture. Now, what I really like about this is it has line numbers always starting at one. You can also turn these off. It's using my favorite font. It's using the theme that I have set in VS Code and it doesn't include stuff that wasn't selected when I took the picture. Click this button, save it to your computer. Now it's extremely customizable. so if you go to the extension page, you can see all of the options that you can change or turn on or turn off. Like you can turn these window buttons on or off. You can turn the line numbers on or off. Um, there's a lot of customization that you can do as well. 
And last on the menu, I'm serving up a GitHub repo that shows you best practices to use when working in a Node.js application. This repo is called Node.js Best Practices, and it is jam-packed with tips and guides on how to write production-ready Node.js code. They have things on project architecture, error handling, code style, testing and quality, going to production, uh, security best practices, performance, Docker, they have it all. And what's really nice is every section not only has a description of how you should do things and why you should do things, they also have real-world examples that you can look at so you can start to apply these best practices in your own code base. And for dessert, I'll show you how to make your application production ready by using Sentry. When you're running your app in production, you wanna have some insight into what is actually going on out there. Are your users running into errors on the client side? Is your backend throwing errors? Is the site loading slow? Sentry gives you that insight. So we're actually using Sentry here on syntax.fm and anytime an error occurs, we get notified about it and we can actually see in the Sentry dashboard. So you can see here on issues, I can see every error that's ever occurred, how often it's occurred, how many users it's affecting. And if I dial into these errors, I can get a front end stack trace, a back end stack trace, and we also have session replay. So we can see exactly what a user was doing when they came across an error on the site. And there's a ton of other features too. One of the things that I really like is the queries tab under performance. And this gives us insight into the backend database queries that are happening on our site. We can see average duration, queries per minute, and this gives me a much better idea of where I should do my performance tuning uh, based on how long these queries are taking. So Sentry is awesome. It gives you a ton of insights so you're not flying blind. And if you want to try it, you can visit sentry.io slash syntax to get two months free. That's it for these 10 tech tapas. If any of them curbed your appetite, let us know down in the comments. And if you're hungry for more tasty treats, check out syntax.fm. All right, I'll see you in the next one.